the sixth episode in our first series of the Sew Ab Fab podcast. I'm Ali and I run Bobbin Sewing School and my co-host is Caroline of the sewing business Sew Ab Fab. Hello Caroline. Hi Ali. Hello everybody. So in our podcast we introduce you to guests that are integral to home sewing or have connections to the sewing industry. Many of our guests have small to medium sized sewing related businesses and all provide necessary resources and products to help you as sewers. Oh, so Caroline, I hope you're well today. I'm good, thank you. How about you? Yeah, I'm fine. I've had a funny old week. You know how you have those weeks where you procrastinate? You've got a list of things to do. And And the list gets longer because you're putting it all off. I know, I know. I feel like I'm like that little cartoon character. If you were like looking at me, it would be like there'd be me sort of like two little me's actually. There'd be me stood on the edge of a cliff with a list of things in front of me and another one behind kicking me saying, come on, get on with it. (laughs) I I, um, follow a a lady who does branding and websites and um, all of that sort on social media. And she did a brilliant post on it. Did and she was saying sometimes we make these jobs too huge and so we look at them and think oh my goodness we can't do it so the example she used was they're renovating a house and if she put on her to-do list renovate a house yes, she'd huge. never do it but by breaking each task down into smaller pieces it's manageable so instead of saying renovate the house she broke it down to remove wardrobes so she knew on that day, all she had to do was get her, to, all she had to do, but all she had to do was get her tours out and do that small task. And she yeah. said, you need to apply that to your social media posts, to your websites. You know, if you say, oh, I want to overhaul my website, that's massive. But if you think, oh, I'm going to change the color on my branding, yes. that's doable in an hour and a half chunk. Yeah, that's true, actually. That's true. Maybe I should really do that. Yeah, yeah. It's just just lots of lots of jobs that you know are not difficult to do it's just sitting there thinking I've got to do that but why am I not doing it you know it's and and you find that with when you've got a list like that and you've got 110 things you want to be doing and you also want to do something for yourself that you're not creativity but everything goes out the window oh gosh yeah yeah no I can't think I can't no and I can't I can't um I lose all yeah, absolutely. Creativity, yeah. all imagination goes. I think it's yeah, and I, and I, you know what I'm like, Ali. I'm like to be organised and an organisational freak. And I find if I've got all that going on in my brain, mm. I can't organise it. So I find it easier to write a, a list of jobs to do, yeah. and and then it looks better, and I can then look at it and go, oh, actually, I could tick this off yes. quite quickly. I, I yeah. love I love crossing things off a list. Yeah. I have to say, and I have been cro- crossing off. And when I look back over the week, and I think actually I have achieved quite a bit, but but for some reason it's it's been a slog, and I think that's really yeah. hard. I think and your days don't flow, and that's yeah, they the, don't. that's the big problem. You have a whole list of things, and you. I sometimes think, oh, if I was in an office, I would actually sit at this and get it done all in one day and be productive but being working from home or in the studio and you get interrupted all the time and that's right you didn't get time to finish anything yeah so I understand you've had a muddled week yeah yeah it's it's uh, I mean we shouldn't complain we're very lucky to do what we do yeah you know yeah and I think but uh, yeah and I was listening to um another podcast and somebody was describing how much they did every week and how many dresses they produced (gasps) Oh, oh, please don't. <laughs> <laughs> it's not. But I have been doing something really fun, actually, Caroline. Really? Yeah, I have. So we have, uh, so our British listeners will know this, that the Great British Sewing Bee is on. And um, one of their challenges in every episode is the pattern challenge. So yes, I have been on the morning after, well, it's, it's slipped this week to later in the day but that was just procrastination (laughs) they were beautiful though but yeah so I have been doing the pattern challenge so I've been watching the episode and thinking okay in the morning that's it I'm going to do that pattern challenge and I post it all on my Instagram story and I try to work through you know um, with little pictures of of how I go about it and I do you know I've really really enjoyed that and it's been 
yeah it's been fun because I've actually made some stuff for myself for once which is really good and you're also sewing I mean I know your feed very well it was it, you're sewing stuff you wouldn't normally sew exactly yeah so it's you know we have made hats once before yes. but you had to go back and revisit it and yeah. you know and yeah. we wouldn't normally sew a baby no. romper no, yeah. no, we wouldn't. And and actually, do you know what? I felt really bad because I've had a little new niece, a great niece, nah. my first great niece, first yeah, great niece nephew. So she's the first one, and um, and I have been thinking I wanted to make her something. So she was born in February, and of course, you know, when I when I had lots of I don't know, I don't know, life changes, doesn't it? Yeah. But when I didn't have all the things going on that I do now, I would have done that at home in the evening, but. I don't know about you, Caroline, but we sew all what well, we we're in the sewing industry. So we don't sew when we go home. We do no. something different. We don't actually choose to spend the evening sewing. But I would have done when I was working. I would yeah. have gone home and when I, I tend to sorry, crash and burn. I was working. I work, yeah. I'm working. But... Yeah, I was going to say, I, I go home and crash and burn. Yeah. And as for the uh, pattern challenge of the Great British Sewing Bee, the paper bag trousers, I never, ever dreamt with my hips. I put paper bag trousers on. And I, I know because I, I mean, I, like you, I, I had to write an article about that. And I was like, and I put in the article, I am extremely pear shaped and I would never, ever no, have put these not... on. But actually they look all right and they're super comfy. So do you know what? I'm going to wear them. <laughs> Good for you. I'm going to too. <laughs> I think it's funny isn't it it's body image I mean yeah you're very you're slim and but you still say you have a pear shape and oh, I'm very I'm busty with a pear shape and you're curvy Ali curvy, you've got curvy. the perfect hourglass figure well I don't know perfect a, a large hourglass <laughs> but do you know what it's it's still isn't it funny how body image has a, yeah, a bearing has on what you really think you should try and wear mm. so pushing yourself and going out of your comfort zone is sometimes a good thing actually so yeah so it's been fun this this pattern challenge so good yeah yes, let's so see what they have next week eh? I know <laughs> <laughs> yeah just yeah, it just it is interesting. Um, and I, I'm really enjoying the sewing bee, I have to say. Yeah, I am too. I think the contestants are brilliant. I think, yeah. you know, they are, they're all novice sewers and they are doing so well. And we know that to do something well in a classroom um, or as a novice sewer at home, you would take twice, three times as long as they're taking to make stuff sometimes four times as long so they are yeah. really really doing very uh, well. I, I mean those max in five hours yeah I know yeah that's mm. pretty much unachievable I mean it they is, did incredibly I mean, well I would I wouldn't be giving myself five hours I'd be giving no. myself far far longer to do them yeah to do properly and and yeah. well and yeah so it's been a great great contest this year I'm not looking forward to the pattern challenge where they either bring in um swimwear or bras that'll be a fun one it's going to come Ali <laughs> no, I'm convinced I swimwear is going to be in it at some point because yeah. they haven't done it have they they no. they've done um corsets and underwear before yes they have yes I think yeah. they did do swimwear once a few years ago was it trunks I don't know I can't remember, I can't it's remember. Been for a no. long time so anyway hopefully <laughs> I mean they've had the extra challenge where they haven't really been able to go into a shop and choose their fabrics to practice at home That's with true you're absolutely right they yeah. haven't no I mean the lockdowns caused a lot of things so mm. but it's nice we've come down and or we've come out of lockdown and we are able to welcome people back into our classrooms which is nice yeah. anyway yeah. fingers crossed it stays that way so yeah. yeah but interestingly you're absolutely right talking about the fabrics isn't it um, that's going to be a good introduction to our guest. But actually being able to go into shops and browse fabrics and feel the drape and the handle and everything is really important. And, oh, I um, think so. And to buy online. I love certain online fabric um, people and I do buy online, but I never, ever buy without buying a sample first. I always mm. buy a sample. Well, I come at a different point of view. So I like you like to go in and feel. And I think when I put my online kits together, mm. I've done all that. So I yes, you know have, you have, yes, that yes. I have given the best possible fabric for that kit. That's so right. hopefully I take a bit of the worry out of people that do buy the kits online oh, that I've taken time to 
yes, um, yes. research the right fabrics for it. Yeah, no, absolutely. And that's yeah. why kits are a great idea because you've had, you have a professional person putting them together yeah. in the background. Yeah. So you know you're getting what you need. And actually, um, in our next guest, we talk about it because obviously I, I haven't been able to go to trade shows. So no. I have been buying fabric online and it yes. is quite scary and daunting. And yes. you do sometimes wonder what you're going to, it is. Um, it's going to come through the door <laughs> <laughs> so what have you been doing this week um I have um no sewing unfortunately um but I'm hoping that actually next week I will be able to sew this so the studio sorry the studio is nearly there and I think once that's done good hopefully I'll be able to actually sit down and sew something for me to so, add it I am desperate 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 for some pj shorts so I am gonna okay gonna have to do to do some of those <laughs> well you did some beautiful um you did your beautiful pj kit yes so yeah, I um it. I need to just yeah I feel guilty at the moment carving out a little bit of time for me I know, but um I know. Yes, but yeah so obviously up at the allotment every day checking on the naughty chickens yes and um and bits and pieces so it's been Good. a positive week this week so first face-to-face mm-hmm. appointment since well, I think it's probably nearly 18 months now. Wow. So that's good. And how did you find traveling? Up well, to in, London. Appointment in London. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us. I, 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 it was quite exciting to be going back up to London. So previous to COVID, I'd go up nearly every month for a hospital appointment. Yes. Um, and I always combine it with fabric shopping. As Ali knows, I never buy anything, but I do the ones that are in central London yes. quite regularly. I love it. I go in there and just spend a happy time so um it was a pre-booked train seat so that's fine and then I, I did check the weather forecast and there's supposed to be no rain and as I got out of the train the heavens opened now um those that know me well know I'm on crutches permanently um so can't hold an umbrella and didn't take a coat with hood because bbc weather forecast said no rain so um so i was like hmm so i had planned to walk to my hospital appointment because of covid so i had to go on the underground Mm -hmm. now i have got my mask on uh, (laughs) but i was quite surprised how busy the underground was considering the time of day and my carriage was full Mm -hmm. there were three people in my carriage for whatever reasons didn't have a mask on so i had to go three stops so I held my breath. <laughs> Caroline, you must have been blue. <laughs> I don't think I was blue. I think I was red. And uh, every time the doors opened when we came to stop, I went. <gasps> and then took another breath in, which probably did more damage than good. But psychologically, in my mind, I've got this, still got this fear of COVID because I am vulnerable and you everything else. Yeah. Ridiculous. Absolutely ridiculous. But what must have been hysterical was when you hold your breath, you pull your mask into your face. <laughs> <laughs> so I had this mask that was stuck to my face and my glasses were steamed. And um, I just must, they must have thought, oh, look at that special person in the corner. Off at my stuff, I was like, oh my God. And, and yeah, and try to casually regroup myself <laughs> and carry it on as though, nothing out of the ordinary was happening oh bless you <laughs> but yeah so I um I went to John Lewis on Oxford Street quickly went and looked at their haberdashery um a p- department and had a had my quick fill and then went on to hospital oh, but uh yeah so oh, I mean it's amazing the things we do at the moment isn't it I mean how yeah. ridiculous to hold your breath for three stops <laughs> just because your carriage was full and someone for their own reasons couldn't wear a mask I know but yeah I was just like there was no what did surprise me was no one had left every other seat free everybody was sat next to each other and that really did astound me I went and stood in the corner as I say looking like a lemon but I you know what (laughs) oh but you know what it'd be fine (laughs) oh if I go down with COVID it didn't work (laughs) (laughs) not gonna happen not bless you bless you got to London and see this person on crutches in the corner with her face mask stuck to her face you know why (laughs) (laughs) 
<laughs> oh, lovely. So we've talked, we, we, we did touch on our guest. So Caroline, do you want to introduce him? I will. We are really happy to be interviewing Damien today. Damien is a textile agent, and I'm sure we've all heard of textile agents, but in reality, we probably know very little about the link between large wholesalers and us as the consumer, both trade and eventually the retail customer. Welcome, Damien. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. How are you? Oh, I'm good too. Damien, that is, that's brilliant. How does being an agent for fabric sales work? Because uh, we know you are the middle man between the manufacturer and the retailer, but um, can you give us a little more insight into what you actually do? Yeah, so, so being an agent is, is very similar to the good old fashioned sales representative, really. Um, as an agent, I'm freelance, so I work for several different companies. Um, it's a commission-based role, so there is no salary. So basically, it's a, it's a very small business um, that I run myself. I work for, I think, six different companies at the moment that I have on my books. And I travel the length and breadth of, of England, really, from, uh, from Newcastle all the way down to Portsmouth and pretty much everywhere in between. Goodness. So how do you decide which manufacturers and designers you want to work with? So really, that kind of evolved as... As the role sort of grew, um, I started off with one company. Um, I've been I've been in the in the industry for twelve years now, um, and I was a rep for two different companies. Unfortunately, both of those companies um, fell by the wayside, and I was made redundant. So I decided rather than have that happen again, and you know potentially risk losing a wage, I uh, I decided to go freelance. So I started off with one company, um, who were the Craft Cotton Company, which is uh, quite a well-known name out there. Yeah. Um, and they cover all bases, to be honest. They're a fantastic company to work with, um, supplying all manner of different fabrics. And really, the, the, my um, stable, as it were, um, evolved around them. So I've now got companies that can supply traditional dress fabrics. I do furnishing fabrics, um, PVCs and tableware, things like that. American quilting cottons and Canadian quilting brands. So really, the, to answer the question, how do I choose the suppliers? It's really where they can jigsaw in with the people that I'm already working with. Um, you can have too much of a good thing. You know, I could take yeah. three or four dress fabric supplies tomorrow, for example. However, that's only going to take away from what I've already got. And it's yeah. finding a happy medium for everybody. Oh, yeah. So, so what drove you towards fabric sales? in particular <laughs> um a failed business to be honest um, i fell into this trade um i've been in sales for pretty much all of my uh, all of my working career um i had a break about 13 years ago and decided to go into retail myself i had a little clothing shop um unfortunately it was a massive disaster um, oh. i had my fingers burnt financially and mentally um and at the time i put my cv online i decided this isn't for me i needed to get out I put my CV online and a headhunter up in Manchester actually found my CV and approached me. Um, wow. So, uh, yeah, I got a phone call out of the blue. Would you like to come up for an interview in Manchester? So off I, off I went. Didn't yeah. even know there was such a thing as somebody out there selling fabric. You know, it wasn't, <laughs> uh, I'll, be, I'll be completely honest, it wasn't my lifelong dream to do this. <laughs> but, but that said, I don't want to do anything else with my life. Um, oh. this, this is my calling. Um, it's funny how these things happen. Um, yeah. here I am 12 years later and I, I can't think of anything else I'd rather be doing yeah isn't it funny because uh, they say there's no such thing as failure it's just research that's right absolutely it's true. yeah absolutely. <laughs> and it's funny, it's funny um, because the chap that I worked for at the time um, is now a good family friend and um, one of the reasons he he sort of selected my CV out of the others was because I'd had the clothing shop so even yeah. though it was deemed to be a failure I suppose at the time yeah. if I hadn't have had that I wouldn't have had the door open to this trade and you know I've never looked back since really so oh, fantastic oh that's <laughs> so have you found it quite difficult have you had to adapt quite a lot over this last year to keep up momentum with your clients I have yes uh, rather rapidly um, yeah. yeah traditionally I would be out on the road Monday to Friday um for want of a better word I'm a traveling salesman yeah yeah uh, so, yeah, um, all of a sudden, the, my, my main stream of income going to see customers was, was taken away. Um, so I had to adapt pretty quickly. And um, fortunately, we live in an age where we've got things like this, Zoom calls, social mm -hmm. media, mobile phones. Um, so, yeah, I just tried to keep in touch with as many people as I could 
as, as quickly as I could really. Yeah. Um, yeah, so that's uh, social media is first and foremost my, my main way of staying in touch with everybody at the moment. And that seems to be working very well. Brilliant. So, again, it's, it's, it's actually something, even though we're now in the process of going back, I've started this week visiting customers again, the social media aspect of it won't go away now. I think that's going to sit side by side with uh, with visiting customers in the flesh. So Great. Yeah. Yeah. Brilliant. So when you see a new range of fabrics, uh, do you wonder immediately or do, can you tell immediately what is going to be the bestseller or can you spot that one that is you're just like oh no why why is they included it <laughs> beauty is in the eye of the beholder um, no, uh, joking aside um i can I, I get passionate about what i do i can see new ranges come through and i can usually say yeah that's a winner that one's going to struggle yeah. um or alternatively you can look at look at a fabric and think that's for that particular customer this customer will much prefer this part of the range yeah. um, so really it's it's a case of matching the customer with the correct fabric so you know um one one doesn't fit all <laughs> no that's a good thing isn't it that's a good it's thing good. yeah it's a good thing I and mean, it's lovely to know that you get excited about new ranges just as much as we do yeah i do yeah um you know i'm, I'm passionate about what i do and, and i hope that you know, as, yeah. as customers, I hope that um, transfers, you, you can see that, you know, I'm not just trying to sell you something. If, if I like a design, I, you know, I really push it. Um, yeah. yeah, I mean, we don't always get it right. There's there's cases where I've, <laughs> I've had egg on my face. Um, you know, yeah. so I think that happens with, with every walk of life. Yeah. Really. Oh, I think I think we all do that, don't we? We all have those moan and moments of like madness. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, but no, it's, it makes it varied and makes it more exciting too. It does, it does. You know, I mean, I've, I, li I like to think that my customers trust me. And if you ask me honestly, Damien, how has this sold for you? I can yes. tell you how it sold for me. And yes. I'm not, I'm not going to try and sell something that's, that's no. a disaster for me onto you to, to move it on because yeah. you know, that's, that's the end of the relationship, isn't it? Absolutely, absolutely. And talking about customer relationships. So I when I was a fashion buyer in retail, we often had, well, we called them traveling salesmen then because that was going back a few years. But yeah, we often had agents like yourselves visit the shop and um, and sometimes they come along with, with really obscure things. Um, and, and we had a couple of salesmen who would, they'd regularly come in and they'd show us their beautiful garments and we'd make the orders and we'd be like, oh, this is exciting. And then you'd go, oh, well, you know, can I just go out to my car and grab X, Y, Z? And we had everything. <laughs> We had like really expensive freshwater pearls that really, really? I was never going to be able to sell. And, uh, <laughs> and then we had odd walking sticks and things like that. Um, do you just deal in fabrics or do you have a, a range of strange things that you bring out as well? <laughs> to be honest, no. Um, it, it's, it's, really, <laughs> it's really fabric. Although ironically, when I was actually working um, as an employee for companies, I was regularly approached by companies saying, oh, do you want to sell this out of your booth? Yeah. And I never did do that. I felt that that was unethical as I was you yeah. know, paid a wage. Ironically, now I work for myself, I never get the opportunity. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't say no, I'd never say never, but um, no, at the moment yeah. it's, it's predominantly fabric. Absolutely well done. <laughs> <laughs> we touched on it before, um, but I do know myself how productive you are with your social media and your emails. Let me know what's coming in and what's about to be released. In normal times, do you find selling face to face is better than the internet driven sales? Do you? Obviously, you build up with a better relationship, I would have thought. Yes. Yeah, I, I, I'll be honest. I don't think there's any substitute for actually face-to-face -face contact. Um, you know, you, you tend to find out so much more about a customer. And it's not just about what the customer wants to buy. You know, I've got customers now that I consider friends. They came to my wedding. You know, uh, we've seen our children grow up together. Yeah. And, you know, you, you are. You, you're building long-term relationships. This isn't a, a one-hit sale. You know, we are. We're here. And hopefully, you know, I've got a touch wood, a long career in front of me. And, you know, I want to be sort of walking alongside my customers with that. Um, and I think, yeah, when, you, when you're in a shop, you can see areas that maybe you're, you're missing on some linens, for example. And I think, oh, this would sit quite nicely with what you're doing from another supplier. Yeah. Um, you know, it gives me an opportunity to see what the market's doing as well. Um, you know, working from home as fantastic as it has been throughout lockdown, 
yeah. all I can see, I'm, I'm quite tunnel visioned. I can only see what I'm doing. Whereas when I'm in a shop, you know, you get chatting to people and they'll show me a fabric from another supplier and say, oh, this has been really good. And it will prompt me to think, well, that's similar to such and such's range. So have a look at this. And things yeah. Like that. So, yeah, yeah. You, you feed off body language. You do. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. Much I mean, you just, again, just touched on something that uh, Ali and I find quite important. And that is the community that there is in the uh, sewing world. Yes. Um, and you know you're saying you've built friendships through your customers um, and we find that with those that come to our classes or um, you know buy the odd bit of pieces from us um, yeah. and I think that's important I think sewing is about community although you often do it on your own it's lovely to have that place to go to that you can chat to others about and you providing that fabric is yeah. an important process in that really yeah. yes yeah it's 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 nice to know that there's a rapport between you and your retailers that they you know probably then yeah. transpond to their customers as well and it's it's a really yeah. important thing isn't it it is it yeah. is i mean while you know I've, I've been in the trade 12 years now i think i mentioned earlier i've been through yeah. two redundancies unfortunately um and the community you know the amount of phone calls that i had from customers some that i haven't spoken to for years um competitors even were getting my number off of customers ringing me up and just wishing me well saying if we can do anything to help yeah. and it really made me feel that this was where I need to be with my life um, mm -hmm. you know, I'm in the right spot it wasn't the right time you know there was um, ups and downs as as his life um, yeah. but yeah the you know when, when the chips were down all of my customers were there and it was fantastic lovely so you said that you're you're away from home quite a bit in normal reality real times <laughs> that makes sense. do you how you know and you said you you uh, sell from the whole of the length and breadth of uh, of England do you find that you are on the road nine every you know every week or uh, yes yes um usually I'm out Monday to Friday um, yeah. with possibly two maybe three overnight stays as well which can be difficult you know mm -hmm. I've got a young family um I've got three children. One of them's left home, but we've got two little ones. It's it's the price I pay to do the job that I love. Um, yeah. And unfortunately, fabric shops are so few and far between. If I just concentrated on Lincolnshire, where I live, I couldn't yeah. make a living. So, I was just about to ask you, you know, obviously you've been doing this for 12 years. Have you seen a growth in smaller independents springing up again? And I just wondered if you'd noticed that there were more about than there were 12 years ago. Absolutely. I've seen a, a real sort of ground change in the industry. Um, yeah. Now, when I first started, it tended to be the consumers in the shops tended to be older ladies, if I'm honest, um, yes. with, with a make do and mend mentality. Yes. Without sounding derogatory, possibly shopping at a jumble sale. So they wanted cheap poly cotton, a pound a metre, because that's what they were comparing with. Now, the, the shopkeepers that are opening up are younger, um, you know, spending more on a piece of fabric that would be comparable with a, a designer brand for example yes isn't, yeah. isn't a big shock to them you know so the the quality of what we as a market are offering is much much improved over the last 12 years um, yeah. and i think that's more consumer driven there's a much younger audience so in now which is fantastic to see um you know and that's going to carry us forward as, a, as an industry for 20 years yeah, I think it will. And I think that sustain sustainability as well. I think people are seeing they're putting value into what they're making and they're making it from a quality product to begin with. If you can use quality ingredients, you're going to have a better product at the end of it. And, and I, I'm sure that's the way it will go. And, and, you know, I've noticed over the time that I've been teaching um, people are prepared to spend a little bit more on fabric now, which is good. And they're sourcing better quality all the time. It's pleasing for me because I, I think that if you buy well, you get a better result at the end of it, something that That's people are going to value. Right. Yeah, yeah. I think sewing nowadays isn't necessarily just to save money. Um, no. Which at some point in time, that was the reason you, you would sew from home to save money. The high street is so cheap. If you want cheap, you can go to Primark. You could never sew it cheaper. It's so, a swear word in our house. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> so, you know, we're, we're targeting an audience that... that not that I'm saying there's anything wrong with Primark, but if you want a quality garment that's well constructed, it's yes. going to last you years and years, and you're going to stand out from the crowd, 
you know, sewing yourself is definitely the way forward. Definitely, definitely. So are you a textile agent for any overseas companies or um, or do any overseas uh, countries or shops buy British fabric from you? <laughs> and how? Um, so through one of my, one of my agencies they distribute for seven or eight different american and canadian quilting brands right, yeah. um so yeah so some of the leading lights in the quilting market um i, I have access to their fabrics yeah um, so yeah that, that's quite interesting to see how the different tastes transfer into the english market because what may be a, a popular collection in america yes. isn't necessarily the same this side of the water very different very different, isn't it? It's, it's very very different. different. and i yeah. think that you know the american market is is very um yeah there's there's a very big difference <laughs> yeah we it's see a huge that. difference yes. so for us in the uk there's one big trade fair a year um for retailers to attend to buy from could you describe what it's like to work at a trade fair of that size and scale I mean it's huge it's it really is it's um I think the only way I can describe it is electric there's a buzz when you walk into the into the room and there's a hustle and a bustle and you know you're seeing old faces that you haven't seen for a year so everybody's happy to be there um me as an agent i'm flitting between two or three different stands which just adds an extra little bit of excitement to it you know you're sort of running about here there and everywhere and it is it's, it's really exciting um you see people there they're planning their year which is fantastic to see yeah uh, so yeah it's, it's an event i really really do do look forward to and i've missed it this year to be honest could you describe your working day so Obviously, it's a long day for you. Yes, oh, crikey. Um, so we would be on stand from 9am, usually. Every 10 minutes, it's changing. You know, you might be dealing with a department store one moment, a market retailer the next, um, old family friends, you know, customers that you've dealt with for 10 years. Then it might be a, a, a newcomer that's never been in the trade before and you, you, you're holding their hand and explaining what we do. So, yeah, every conversation is different. It's It really is um electrifying really and then to add in the fact that i'm doing that for several different companies all at the same time in the same building it can be um be a bit of a whirlwind exhausting i yeah. think you need a holiday once you've finished <laughs> it's, it's, it's ironic we usually sit and have a drink afterwards we obviously it's a two or three day show so we're yeah. all over in hotels and yeah. in the evening you can see in the bars we're all sat there with a beer yeah. and even though we're exhausted you're still on a high like, so you, yeah. you need a couple of hours to come back down to earth really and then uh, yeah starts again the next day we ali and i obviously been to it several times and, and we book a hotel so yeah. we do it two days yeah. so on the first day we go and we take photos and we arrange the appointments for the following day yeah. and then the next day we go and we, bu and we buy um yeah. but we saw people in the hotel and actually it was interesting because we met up with other retailers so yeah. obviously we know that all the agents are there but it gives us an opportunity to meet up with people that we've built a community with yeah. um over the years as well um I, I think and they've got obviously educational talks and everything else i think it is it's very important to the sewing industry to keep it alive definitely yeah. Yeah. yeah, and I don't. I like to point out actually as well. Um, it's interesting. I should imagine that if you, as a home sewer, somebody that sews at home, when they go to a retail store, most of them are female led. But when you go to the shows, most of the uh, the salespeople. Yeah. Um, I know this is being genre specific, but there's a lot of gentlemen involved. There's a lot of gentlemen involved. I'd say it was gentleman heavy on, on yeah. in your area. It is. It is. Yes. There are there are more ladies um, on the road nowadays than, yeah. than there ever was. Um, but I think the role of a travelling salesman or salesperson, yes. I say, has always been top heavy with with chaps. Um, yeah, and that's quite possibly because you know you're away from the family. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it does tend to be a, a male centered world, which is quite surprising, as you say, because we're not necessarily yeah. always. No, but but then I come from a tailoring background and most of the tailors are gentlemen. Yeah. 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 It's, it's it is changing. The women are yeah. coming, coming yes. through, um, but predominantly still it, it's it's male based. It is. Yeah. Um, so with this past year of everything that's gone on do you think it's changed people's perception of sewing and the sewing industry i do i think it's it's given the trade a shot in the arm no pun intended um 
<laughs> yeah, I think I think we as a trade are going to come out of this with so many more end users because one thing it has given a lot of people is time to experiment and time to actually get back to doing things they love. We all live in a very, very busy world. We're rushing about here, there and everywhere. You know, we're always against the clock. And actually what this has done is given us a chance to stop and reflect and, and spend a bit of time on ourselves. I've seen again over the last 10 years, 12 years or so, I think once upon a time you would go to work with your hands and you'd come home and you'd sit and watch a box in the corner, wouldn't you? Whereas nowadays, most of us are doing this. We're going to work and we're looking at screens and we're sat there, you know, goggle eyed all day. And I think actually people want to come home and use their hands. And I think sewing is a, a fantastic way of, of releasing yeah. that really. So. Yeah, it is. It is. I'd like to just point out here, I go home and sit in front of that box in the corner of the, in the, corner of the room. <laughs> crochet or knit or something Alan. you don't just sit there oh, sometimes sometimes I do <laughs> doesn't matter what it is <laughs> so Damien I know our uh, listeners can't see you but I can and I'm looking behind you and you're sat uh on the back of your chair as a quilt so I'd like to know we're intrigued do you or anybody in your family so do you to bring home the goodies for them oh, well <laughs> ironically back to our previous conversation there my wife um my wife started sewing in lockdown um Brilliant. the same as many many people she yeah. didn't have time we've got three kids she yeah. was in business as well um you know she, she's always had an eye for it but never really had the time to do it she started with face masks then it moved on to dolls clothes for the girls and she's making oh. garments she's on quilts she's doing brilliant all so, wow. yeah, it's a prime example of what's happened to Gosh, she's a lucky lady. <laughs> what, what samples? So it sounds like you are very busy with work and family, but if you could have a day doing anything you like, what would it be? I think at the moment a walk around a golf course would be marvellous. <laughs> oh, Damien, it's been absolutely brilliant chatting to you um, and thank you for allowing us to interview you too. Um, so, yeah, I think that's a glimpse of the textile agent and how your fabrics get from a to b you know it's another stage isn't it so yeah thank you that's brilliant yeah, my pleasure. oh gosh damien was great caroline i mean the world of a textile agent must be so exciting i'm quite jealous i'd love to be surrounded by fabrics all day every day and passing them on and seeing what's new coming in and, and i know and to be, to be surrounded by constant color as well oh yeah um, because uh, the fabrics that Damien works with are beautiful. I'm very lucky. I often buy the Peter Horton fabrics off him. So yes. all my cotton lawns and viscose and bits and pieces. So they are beautiful. Yeah. And actually just to be um, going from business to business must be quite exciting. Because yeah. we're all so different. I know we do the same thing, but we're all different characters. And Absolutely. Yeah, mm. so I think he gets a mm. great insight into what it takes to run a sewing business. So who's going to be our next guest, guest, Caroline, on the podcast? So our next guest is Mark from Patency. Now, some of you may have heard of Patency. Patency is a company that prints out your PDF patterns onto uh, special paper oh. uh, to save you sticking all the A4 pieces together so if you send him an a0 file he then puts that onto a very large sheet of paper for you ready for you to cut out um so another interesting gentleman who sees the sewing world from a different perspective yeah very much i mean if you're if you've never used a downloadable file a uh, downloadable pattern rather before then what happens is they come as um, pdfs and they are generally a4 or A0 and the A4 you can print at home but I've been caught out and had to print out loads and loads of yeah pieces of paper in the past and spent more time sticking those together than making the actual garments so that I know really and interesting and if you don't get it lined up right your your pattern's off by a quarter of an inch um so yes so Mark's company is really uh quite important now because yeah. a, a lot of the pattern houses are going to um, PDFs, especially mm -hmm. while they're at the moment, they're regrading their pattern sizes to um, include a fuller size range. Yes. So at the moment, before they print them off, they're, they're all going to PDF. Um, so, and uh, Mark 
prints for all over the world. So it actually has some big pattern companies that use him to print their regular patterns Amazing. anyway. Amazing, yeah. amazing. So I'm going to look forward to hearing from him. So if you have enjoyed our podcast and you would like to hear more, please do subscribe. You can find more details about us and our links to the show at www.soabfabpodcast.podbean.com and there you will find our website links and social media feeds. Keep in touch. And in the meantime, everybody, have a great week and happy sewing. Happy sewing. Bye. 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 <laughs>